um, a very warm welcome, even though it's only a virtual one, sadly, to Meeting Minds Global 2021. My name is Christine Barahone. Um, I'm the Alumni Relations Officer at the School of Geography and the Environment, and I'm passing on the best wishes uh, from our head of school, uh, Professor Gillian Rose, who very sadly can't be with us tonight, but um, really hopes you will have a very, very interesting time um, at the whole event and at this session in particular. Anti-racism and geography education is the first talk that we are contributing to the week-long program and we are very, very pleased about the great response we've heard from all of you um, to what we thought would be a very topical issue to bring onto the agenda. Um, I don't want to take up um, a lot of your precious time, um, but I have to mention that this session is being recorded. Um, so please make sure that you are muted um, during the talk um, and ideally also have your camera turned off um, if you don't want to appear in any window in the recording because that sometimes happens. But now I have the great pleasure um, of introducing our speakers to you today, um, starting with Dr. Amber Murray. After academic stints in Cairo, the US and Ethiopia, she came to Oxford to the School of Geography in 2018 as Associate Professor in Human Geography. Um, she's also a Fellow and Tutor um, at Mansfield College. She is a decolonial political geographer and anti-racist educator working in the inter interdisciplinary fields of political ecology, the geopolitics of knowledge and resistance studies. Her motto is that scholarship should be active, engaged, accessible and decolonizing. Over the last 10 years, she's been working on the connection between resource extraction, social change and knowledge development in contemporary African societies, and is in the process of writing a book on this topic, uh, Slow Descent, Fast Capitalism, a decolonial mixtape of the afterlives of extraction in Central Africa. Talking about mixtapes, Amber is exploring new creative ways of knowledge exchange and communications by collaborating with filmmakers and hip hop and reggae musicians on a documentary and is currently working with comedians to produce a film on humor and environmental justice in Cameroon. So watch this space. Another example of her active, engaged, accessible and decolonizing approach is her research on um, the way that geography is being taught in our schools and how it should be taught, taught in the future, which is where her collaborator, Stephen Puttick, and our second speaker today comes in. Steve is officially based just across the University Parks at the Department of Education, where he is Associate Professor of Teaching Education and Curriculum Tutor for the Geography of PGCE and the MSc Learning and Teaching. He knows all the groundwork as he was a geography teacher himself and a head of department before coming to Oxford to do his DPhil in education. In his research, he is particularly interested in how geography is, um, how geography as an academic discipline feeds into the school subject. Apart from his work on anti-racist curriculum futures with Amber, he's currently leading research on climate change education futures in India on, and on the role of cultural heritage in curriculum making in Calcutta. Thank you both, Amber, yes, for zooming in and for sharing your insights we'll the... into anti-racism and geography education. And um, there's somebody who hasn't got their microphone muted. Could I please get you to check? Um, and yes, it's <laughs> then it's all over to you, Amber and um, Steve. Thank you. And Ian, um, just to say, I think it was your uh, microphone that's not muted. Ian Curtis says. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to. All of the. Okay, great. Um, hello. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Um, wherever you're joining us from, it's just a real pleasure uh, to join you for this session of um, Oxford's Global Meeting Minds. Um, 2021. I'd like to thank Dr. Christine Barahone for 
really a lovely introduction, um, but also for all of the logistical and planning assistance which went into making this talk and this series of talks possible. Thanks very much to our Oxford alumni, colleagues and friends um, for joining us to discuss anti-racism and geography education. We would also like to begin by sharing our gratitude and appreciation for educators who have been long working on and teaching anti-racist pedagogies and content. Steve and I have learned a tremendous amount from our conversations with teachers on these topics and gratitude for their work, I think is especially important given the challenges of school teaching during the pandemic. In our brief discussion today, Steve and I are going to work through some of our findings from an analysis of national curriculum documents and examination specifications for British school geography. This is something that we did um, in November and December of 2019. And the findings of which were published in the autumn 2020 edition of the Geography Association's journal Geography, which you see featured here. What we found um, was that you know, and now I want to step back and give some context, despite contemporary claims by some media outlets and politicians, right, which emerged a, a few months after the publication, that critical race theory or decolonized approaches to education have achieved something like educational hegemony in British schools, what our review of the curriculum demonstrated, in fact, the exact opposite that there is a striking near total absence of content looking at race and racism in geography schooling. Steve and I argue that even leading pedagogical approaches like powerful knowledge and cultural literacy show the need for school geography to be informed by a more expansive understanding of the discipline. And indeed, there is a vast body of scholarship by Black British geographers that is central as educators respond to the urgent need for anti-racist geographies. In our article, we draw from decolonial and indigenous scholarships as well, um, but for the purposes of time, here we restrict our focus to thinking about the importance of anti-racist geographies and Black geographies. We would like to begin with a brief interactive exercise for those of you who are interested in participating, of course. As Steve and I have had conversations with different groups about the significance of education in shaping perceptions of race, space, and power, we have sometimes opened with a variation of one central question for the audience. That is, what were you taught about race and colonialism in school geography? On the slide here, you see examples of some actual student responses to this question, which was posed during a recent PGCE geography session. So if you would like to share your response to this question about what you were taught about race and colonialism, could you please um, click on the link which is being shared in the chat and just quickly type out a response. Please note that this will be visible to all, but your responses are anonymous. So as you're doing that, I'm going to continue and Steve is going to return to those answers in a moment. But for now, I'd like to lead us through thinking about some of the historical, disciplinary and conceptual context for today's discussion, after which Steve will lead us through our curriculum analysis and we will turn towards some of the formidable anti-racist and black geographies, which are important for teaching British school geographies differently. Now this self-reflexive exercise, which I've just invited you to take part in, is intended, of course, to signal 
the individual implications of a, a relative lack of educational content on racism, on racialization, on colonialism, and on empire. But importantly, individual implications point to larger disciplinary and institutional trends, which make up our historical and contemporary context for this discussion. So let me ground this um, in history. One of our colleagues at the School of Geography and the Environment, Professor Danny Dorling, has argued that the quote, purpose of geography originally was as a subject of empire, to know about the empire before going out and serving it. Geography has its origins with people like Halford Mackinder, who cared deeply about the British empire. The purpose of geography was to produce colonial officers, end quote. Indeed, the imperial underbelly of British geography hits quite close to home for those of us working in Oxford. As many of you, or, you know, as many of you probably know or might know, Halford Mackinder was appointed reader in geography at the University of Oxford in 1887 and he became the School of Geography's first director in 1899. The British geographer Jerry Kearns describes, quote, Mackinder's geography was not only a science of empire, it was also a way of promoting the cause of empire. In 1899, Mackinder led an expedition to Mount Kenya in an attempt to be the first white man on Africa's second highest peak. The members of the expedition consisted of 66 Swahilis, two Maasai, 99 Kikuyu guides and porters, as well as six Europeans. The journey was marked by violence from the beginning. Mackinder used Swahili slave laborers as porters, whom he compared to animals, for example, calling them, quote, faithful dogs in his diaries. African slaves and laborers were disciplined and intimidated with the whip and the firearm, including by Mackinder himself. Mistreated and facing possible starvation, a group of laborers sought to escape. Eight porters were shot by orders. While the historical records remain debated, in part because of Mackinder's own silence on, about the killings, these executions were likely for insubordination or desertion. In May 2020, the staff of the School of Geography and the Environment voted to remove Mackinder's name from our main lecture theater. But this is part of the historical and epistemological legacy of British geography. And this historical legacy has contemporary significance. There's a considerable body of scholarship outlining the imperatives of anti-racist geographies, which has long critiqued the normative whiteness and dominance in geography. And by whiteness here, I'm drawing on the scholarship of W.E.B. Du Bois, Noel Ignatiev, and others who write about whiteness as a social category um, and also a system of racial entitlement that necessarily relies on the marginalization of people racialized as non-white. Within white dominant and racialized societies and spaces, whiteness, and in particular white masculinity, is frequently taken as the unstated but effective norm. That is, it masquerades as the normal, as the objective, as the unbiased, as the universal. Within the discipline, Audrey Kobayashi, Linda Peek, Natalie Oswin and others have documented the persistent whiteness of Euro-American geography. In the UK, Mark McGuinness has helpfully termed this phenomenon, quote, white blind geography. The introduction of blind is significant here because it serves precisely as a reminder of the ways in which whiteness dominates through practices, 
perspectives and norms which are unstated or unaddressed, but omnipresent and privileged. In the article titled The White Unseen on White Supremacy and Dangerous Entanglements in Geography, which was published in 2020 in the journal Area, Eratina Hamilton describes the discomforted and alienating experience of students of color learning within the quote, white blind geography of the geographical tradition. During my first year in graduate school, I read from the canon of white geographers and marveled at the audacity of it all. I read the classics where black and brown people were either erased or constructed as biologically inferior to whites. Race was a byproduct and aside to the real action of exploration and discovery. Geography as a discipline was framed as blameness but geography is not and has never been innocent. These make up some of the important tapestries of scholarship exposing the ways in which whiteness informs the structures, institutions, and praxis within which geographers work. And that which have been termed the quote moves to innocence by institutional and hegemonic actors as they make visible but frequently superficial moves um, to critical or anti hegemonic praxis. In using this term moves to innocence, I'm evoking a terminology that has been used by indigenous scholars and indigenous educators, um, namely Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang, who describe the ways in which white um, settlers claim emancipated status and take credit for progressive actions. And they do so in ways which would whitewash um, or render them innocent for historical, structural, and contemporary dispossessions, exploitations, and injustices. So Steve and I are interested in thinking about the ways in which whiteness continues to inform geography specifications and the framings of lessons in British geography. And we're interested in learning with and thinking about the potentials of and for anti-racist geographies. Social scientists and human geographers agree that race is a social construct rooted in politics, in place, in spatial practice, in history, rather than in genetic, genetics or biology. Of course, this does not mean or imply that race is a fiction with no material effects. Rather, racialized ways of thinking inform action, they inform behavior, they inform social interactions, and therefore they're rendered real. Racialization refers to the social, political, economic, and spatial consequences of the construction of race as a means of differentiating between where white people have been valued above people who are racialized as non-white or people of color. Racial practices and racializations have varied significantly from time um, to, to time and from place to place. So race is not a natural category as geographers um, have long written and argued, right? Exposing the importance of rather an anti-essentialist perspective on race, which shows the diversities and the ambiguities and the complexities within um, one race's experience of space and place. But our role as social scientists is precisely to analyze the specific processes of racialization and to identify their material consequences, right? So the material racial inequalities that emerge from patterns of racialization as um, the one featured on the slide here in terms of um, uh, black British rates of homelessness, which far exceed their proportion of the population. And importantly, our role is to create the space in which our students learn to discern these as well. So teaching against the unstated norms of whiteness and against the racist ideas that underpin white dominate societies entails a denaturalization of whiteness, 
and of race by addressing it openly and therefore critically examining racialization. Here we might turn to um, the influential work of the Black American historian, Ibram X. Kendi, who writes, quote, the opposite of racist is not not racist, but anti-racist. So here he's drawing inspiration from the Black feminist scholar, Angela Davis, who in 1979 wrote, quote, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. Kindy continues, quote, one either allows racial inequalities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequalities as an anti-racist. There is no in-between safe space of, quote, not racist end quote. So this is because we live, each of us, in bodies, and we live, each of us, in bodies, in societies which are racialized and racializing. For Kindi, racist notions are ideas, and as such, are flexible, are changing, but then are also stoppable, are changeable. Right, Kendi's definition of a racist idea is actually remarkably simple. A racist idea is, quote, any concept that regards one racial group as inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. At the center of anti-racist geography is an insistence on acknowledging the spatial and epistemic power of whiteness, as well as the diverse and anti-essentialist truths of black and brown perspectives on and experiences of place and space. So as educators, this includes asking questions and thinking self, beginning with a self-critique, thinking in self-reflexive ways about who is celebrated in the classroom and who is cited, who do we read and who are we assigning to our students to read. Um, also, how do we speak, for example, to the diversity of black, brown, white, Asian experiences of urban and rural spaces. As educators, this also means refusing to be silent on race. Robin DiAngelo in White Fragility wrote that the silence on race is one of the most important things that keeps white supremacy in place. And our current era is dominated by the tensions between two dominant sets of racial ideas. So again, working from the work of Ibram Kindi, we might see that on the one hand, we have a set of ideas propagated by what Kindi would call colorblind segregationists, right? Those who ascribe to the notion of a post-racial society who, um, you know, for whom race problems are resolved by not seeing them, by not acknowledging them, by actively ignoring them. So this is best epitomized in the notions or claims that I do not see race or I you know, do not speak about race, therefore I'm not racist. So that's on the one hand and on the other hand, um, we see the domination of a kind of multicultural assimilationalism, where assimilationism for whom race problems are solved by a kind of romanticized revision of the past as well as current inequalities. And so this is a kind of melting pot notion of education for where all voices are included, but we don't have a critical um, understanding and, and reading of power and historical and contemporary inequalities um, between those experiences. Um, so anti-racist pedagogies refuse both of these um, notions and approaches. And here we can also take inspiration um, from another geographer uh, from the movement, Why is Our Geography Curriculum um, So White? Which was co-founded by a fellow Oxford geography alumnus, Dr. Adam Elliott Cooper, who's seen at the bottom of your screen here several years ago, right? So again, addressing race as being a central way um, of moving towards anti-racist futures. 
These issues remain as important as ever. Again, as seen in this professional geographer magazine, which captures, quote, a geographer's view, right? And what will you notice when you look at the faces on this page um, intended for, you know, undergraduate and postgraduate students to inspire them to enroll in geography um, curriculums? Well, this is nearly uh, exclusively white men who stand in to, you know, as representatives of the geographer's view. So against complicit silence, geography teachers would teach racialization as fundamental to geographical understandings of the world. As Steve will show through some concrete examples now, this means that we critically examine its role in the marginalization and subordination of other countries if through imperialism, materialism, and colonialism. And in, within this remit, statements, you know, institutional statements and collective statements are necessary, like the one which our school has released um, and which is seen here but they must be bolstered with thoughtful and self-reflective actions, which importantly center the perspectives, the expertise and the lived experiences of our colleagues of color. I now would like to turn the floor over to Steve. Thanks very much, Amber. And thanks very much um, everyone for um, so proactively getting involved with our question um, and hearing us in response to this question, what were you taught about race and colonialism in school geography? Um, and I'm sure from looking at everyone else's and from looking on the Jamboard, um, you'll see that overwhelmingly um, nothing is the thing that comes out, that's come out with us kind of time and time again in terms of questions that we've asked to people doing their PGCE course, so that um, one year postgraduate certificate of education, um, and to DPhil students in geography as well, asking this question, what have you been taught about race and colonialism in school geography? And overwhelmingly we get this huge silence, which we'd expect given the way in which the curriculum has treated or not this topic. And obviously there's been some kind of really topical debate in terms of the politics and the ways in which um, governments, not just in England, but um, internationally have decided actually we're going to um, kind of head on tackle this and do different things um, in terms of either reactions to critical race theory or in terms of reports to commission and so on um, to try to again deal with this issue that's been dealt with so unsatisfactorily um, in the curriculum. And I think for us really highlights this massive disconnect between the discipline and the school subject in a really concrete way that in terms of geography education research, we're often talking about the relationship between the academic discipline and the school subject in abstract terms. But this seems to be something where there's so much work that's been done in the discipline to really think hard about the discipline itself. And Amber obviously highlighted some of the ways in which McKinder and others are really problematically engaged in and actively fostering the colonial project through geography but in different ways the ways in which geographers have been responding and turning that upside down and actually um, using the discipline's tools to ask much more critical um, and progressive questions about race and racialization and um, just to give a couple of examples about the ways in which this enduring silence has then kind of manifested itself in terms of the things that we see in um, teaching resources and I just kind of preface this by what we've um, referred to as this kind of parody test to try to understand um, about teaching resources and to understand the ways in which they're constructing representations of people and places. Um, just start off with a kind of an extreme example from Twitter about the kind of um, consequences of this ongoing silence and this inability to um, understand some of the colonial legacies. And I thought it's a really um, useful kind of example You'll see there that this tweet um, from historian Edward Anderson about the renaming of this road, road in Southall. And it's really interesting because of the, obviously the big associations that the names had, the original name taken from this colonial British general and then the new name taken from the Sikhs who are living in this area and the different ways in which these kind of histories um, have been played out. And then the next slide shows a uh, just one of the many responses that he had to this um, tweet 
one person if they were taken off there what a load of nonsense what if we went to india and started to change their street names what indeed if we went to india and did exactly that and i think that the way in which that's then um kind of uh, slightly humorous and um, thing to us looking at it, actually that attitude is replicated in geography curricula it's represented in the ways in which these victorian myths about British involvement in other countries is represented in the school subject. Um, and just to kind of take this idea of a parody test a little further, there's a few um, examples of the ways in which a brilliant satirist um, who's been looking at the ways in which um, across North America and across the UK, um, recent events might be displayed in terms that are often used when our media and our, um, I mean, you might think about the World Factbook, you might think about the FCO website and the kinds of languages that are used to describe other places. And so here we have um, a tweet from just before the polls being set to open. And you the, see the kind of metaphors, you see the ways in which the oil rich, nuclear armed and so on. And here the analysts are skeptical the election will end months of political violence. Something that, and kind of phrasing that is really stark and really jars against the ways in which we're constantly reading about and hearing about the US. That these terms and these associations, troubled or rich, violence and so on, are often used of other countries and particularly African countries. And um, I mean, this kind of thread has then run on for um, uh, about nine months now, and you can kind of have a look into the massive amount of um, satirical commentary that has got going on there. But the next one refers to uh, a naming process. So if you're not familiar with um, Milton's work, then it's definitely worth having a look in the satire of the River Gulu um, in Europe that I'll show in a moment, that is what we would refer to as the Thames. And the, the absolute kind of comedy of doing this and referring to this as a discovery when we know all too well that there are people who have lived there and have referred to it by another name for a huge amount of time. Um, and yet, even in geography textbooks, the replication of this kind of satire continues. Um, the next slide just has a kind of a similar thing about particularly humanitarian disasters and the language of that that we then see when we look at geography textbooks, when we look at some of the ways in which people like Civitas have represented other places and have tried to, in what is a really challenging thing in the school subject, representing the complexity of whole countries to young people whose both time constraints in terms of the number of hours that geography is given and whose broader vocabulary and knowledge of the world is such that actually there needs to be a lot of simplification that happens in order to get something that's understandable and can be communicated. And yet something happens when that simplification happens. Something happens when we represent and when we abstract. And using this kind of parody highlights the ways in which that kind of simplification and that kind of abstraction has been racializing and has been incredibly negative on many of the other countries, particularly countries that have been tied up with Britain's colonial past. And um, the next slide just shows a photo um, of Milton next to this discovery. And there's some great kind of writing around that that I think really helps to what we've referred to this as a kind of parody test, but really helps for teachers to try and get a sense of the ways in which those really deeply ingrained things that have been given very little attention and haven't been made explicit, the ways in which colonialism and race have been just silenced, means that the language and the tools that we've got to then try and unpick and to critically explore those things are quite limited. And doing something quite stark like this and using parody like this might be a really helpful way to try and unpick and to try and rethink the ways in which we're representing places and people. And just to kind of follow this with an example from India, um, here's some quotes from uh, a kind of popular school geography book. There might be many others that you can use. I think these are completely representative of the ways in which um, countries and particularly India and India's development is represented. And here we see it being portrayed as an accelerating growth of the Indian economy. That's a phenomenon of the 21st century. Reducing poverty remains India's greatest challenge. 
And then the next slide, hopefully really pick up those echoes of the kind of satire countries that India is associated with, with declining income per capita, being left behind, lacking in wood investment, but with disease, poverty and civil disorder. It's almost exactly the same kinds of things that you would see written in these kind of satires. And jars so strongly against the history that I'm sure you'll be far more familiar with that actually we've got a country and a region that was just exploited and that went from being the richest country and the richest region in the world, thinking kind of late 1700s, India's producing 25% of world GDP against, at that point, Britain producing kind of 2.8 or something percent of world GDP. And then we get this colonial extraction working in this incredibly efficient way to strip resources and assets and to bring these, in some cases, literal jewels like the Kohinoor that's on um, obviously the crown jewels right now um, into England and away from India. But the Victorian myths about the period and the Victorian ways of speaking about those relationships, not as extractive colonial relationships, but as something that was far more paternalistic, something that involved um, giving things, railways, law, democracy, these kinds of things. And these Victorian myths then get re reproduced in the ways in which both curriculum and those powerful voices who are lobbying curriculum. And, and this works kind of differently in different places, but particularly in England, the ways in which think tanks and the ways in which some other public bodies work to um, create these kind of policy discourses um, means that they've got quite significant influence sometimes over things that are happening. But Stivitas is one example um, and the ways in which they describe this period of British history that saw huge economic growth, a process of social and political democratization and an extension of political influence worldwide. Now, this extension of political influence is certainly something um, that you might frame in quite a different way. And historian William Dalrymple um, kind of captures some of this um, in his work on the anarchy, as he calls the East India Company. This Victorian myth of it being a national transfer of knowledge, railways and the arts of civilization, And this calculated and deliberate amnesia about the corporate looting that opened British rule in India we'd argue is something that is then seen in these current curriculums, the ways in which we can all type, what do I learn about colonialism? What do I learn about race in my former school geography? Well, nothing. And this deliberate amnesia being a direct product of the ways in which these kind of Victorian myths are framed. And Dalrymple's own kind of um, description of the period and of that process completely contrasts against this transfer of knowledge, railways and the arts, that he describes the ways in which, and this was taken um, from a submission at the time of the, um, I think something submitted to the parliament at the time about the Bengal carcass being bleaching in the wind and is almost picked to the bone and this brutal role of extraction that took a country and a region producing way beyond anything that Britain was producing to then being something that could be described in this kind of carcass-like state. And for us, these negatives are not just historic, but these racialized inequalities continually to powerful, powerfully shape experience and opportunity. And I, I mean, whether that's something um, that's about housing, whether that's something about space, whether that's something about education and the geographies of education, our argument is that race and colonialism is something that school geography absolutely needs to confront far more explicitly. And the discipline offers some really interesting and useful tools to help us do that work. Sorry, trying to manage both the slides and unmuting myself is proving um, more complicated than anticipated. Um, thanks, Steve. So just briefly to kind of wrap up then, um, what might anti-racist school geography look like? Um, well, you know, recently I want to turn to um, a teaching collective, a British teaching collective called Decolonized Geography which has recently published um, a really comprehensive teacher's response to the Commission on Race, Race and Ethnic Disparities report. 
Um, and if you have time or if you haven't looked at it, I encourage you to read it. They make many really important points, um, but two of which I want to mention here in thinking about what an anti-racist school geography looks like. The first is that the model of education, which is advocated in the commission, in the report, is based on fostering a, quote, unifying sense of Britishness, right? And that this dangerously overlooks the racial power asymmetries, both historically and contemporaneously. And the second point that they make that I wanna pick up on in response to this question is the need to foster systems of support to upskill teachers. This means allocating resources for training, um, making, making space for time for teachers um, and resources for materials for teachers to collaborate um, to collaborate with other teachers, to collaborate um, with academics, to collaborate with students and other collectives, to create anti-racist um, or decolonizing uh, lessons. And here again, I emphasize the importance of listening to teachers' experiences and acknowledging their expertise. Um, and that this is part of, you know, situating this conversation within anti-racist teaching tradition, um, which has indicated the imperative of also starting with the self, right? So as teachers cultivating deliberate self-awareness on the part of the teacher as a way, as a part of this kind of comprehensive anti-racist teaching. So we've drawn upon in our article, as well as in our brief discussion today, the perspectives of black geographies in thinking through anti-racist intellectual practices, which are grounded on multidimensional and non-essentialist interpretations of communities and places racialized as black and brown. Anti-racist pedagogies examine the ways in which we, as educators, are complicit with current racial orders and think about actively imagining future classrooms otherwise. There's a long tradition of anti-racist geography from which to build upon, and we've not done this literature and this tradition justice here. Um, but on this slide, I featured some of the important scholarship of contemporary Black British geographers, including Patricia Daly, Patricia Noxolo, James Esson, Leova Hirsch, Adam El Elliott Cooper, and there are so many others um, who deserve space um, and attention. This long history of anti-racist geography and Black geographies in Britain are a tremendous resource for geography, geography teachers. These traditions clearly indicate that the anti-racist and racial justice movements within education, right, these contemporary movements, Black Lives Matter, um, and here roads must fall, which have helped provide a wider public platform for serious discussions about racial violence and racial in, in, inequality, um, th that this long tradition of scholarship shows that these are not whims and these are not passing trends, but we're just seeing the iceberg because media attention has been pivoted towards it now, um, but these are sustained intellectual traditions. And turning to also to the important work of Black British geographers, um, I would say is absolutely crucial to demystifying this claim, which I've heard um, that anti-racism or anti-racist educational movements are somehow an American import. So finally, to conclude, to kind of return to these questions which have reemerged throughout this discussion. Um, these are just a series of questions um, that you know, might help us as we work towards this aspiration of being of not of moving beyond being not racist to being and actively anti-racist. So again, how do we represent places, right? You know, Steve has just uh, spoken about this, but also the practice of framing students' learning of complex spatial phenomenon, right? Which the, the, the tendency has been to this 
kind of binary perspective of segregating complicated spatial phenomenon into, thing, into columns like opportunities versus challenges or weakness versus strengths. And how can you do that when we're talking about um, you know, largely violent historical spatial processes like colonialism or the transatlantic slave trade, for example. So against this, how do we help students appreciate the intersectional nature of issues um, how, you know, in what ways do we describe peoples in our courses and course materials, uh, including how white people are de-racialized and the racialization of things like impoverishment, poverty, um, you know, where textbook cases uh, tend to be ahistorical, as Steve has said, um, and that, you know, examples for underdevelopment are deeply ahistorical and racializing. So to what extent do we explicitly acknowledge these colonial legacies and their continuing effects? Um, who do we celebrate and who do we cite? So these of course are preliminary questions rather than exhaustive questions. Um, and with that, I would thank you so much for your time and say that I look forward to uh, the discussion and your questions. So I'm appearing again. Thank you so much, Amber and Steve, um, for all these insights and um, all the things that you've researched. Um, I'm sure there will be plenty of questions also following up on, um, on the uh, input you uh, collected in the chat. So um, you can either use the chat for submitting a question and I will read it out to both of our speakers, or if you prefer, you can unmute yourselves, you can raise a hand, turn your video on if you prefer a bit more uh, of face-to-face um, -face interaction. Um, so whatever you would like to do, um, just let us know. So can I see anything? Not yet. Just touching the chat. Nothing right now. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of really interesting points in the chat. <laughs> I don't know if Abby, you want to pick up or if um, I think Angie and Sun have both um, yeah, some like, kind of really interesting comments. If there's anything that would be useful for us to address, because I do think the issue of um, time is a, a, a kind of a really important one and one that we've seen in some of those recent debates. I mean, Amber kind of pulled up one of the issues with time being the kind of critique that it's a, a sudden or a recent um, thing or that it's an import. And I mean, Dan Hicks has made this um, argument recently in terms of the restitution of the Benin bronzes that um, kind of the number of articles that have said um, well, they suddenly want to <laughs> return them or there's suddenly a, a desire. And it's kind of, I mean, both kind of not true because of the ways in which um, there are some really long-standing um, calls for those things and obviously the way in which the argument about something being um, recently is kind of ridiculous as well if something's been stolen um, but the kind of Ian Curtis's comment um, there can you say more about the celebration element as a positive driver Amber I don't know if you want to pick it up sure thanks Ian yeah, um, I mean, this is really getting at the heart of moving towards a more multidimensional um, way of teaching um, black and bl brown geographies, right? So that um, there is, you know, space for celebrating and acknowledging um, you know, the creative and intellectual contributions um, and, you know, some of that rich tapestry rather than the focus being um, kind of case studies of, you know, Nigeria is taken as a case study for students to understand um, an, an underdeveloped country rather than Nigeria being taken as a case study to understand geographies of happiness, for example. There's a question about yellow geography. 
Yeah, and a question about um, indigeneity as well. Oh, sure. So I can respond to um, the question about indigeneity. Um, so in the the um, the piece that this talk draws from, um, we looked heavily at both decolonial uh, geographies and black geographies and um, decolonial geographies have pulled broadly from um, the kind of longer tradition of indigenous scholarship within the social sciences to look at perspectives um, well, not necessarily perspectives, but worldviews, epistemologies and ontologies that um, have not been informed or conformed to Western or Euro-American norms. Um, and so decolonial geographies have been really important in the last uh, kind of, especially in the last decade, um, but, you know, approximately two decades, thinking about moving beyond critique, right? So responding to a, a post-colonial scholarship, which critiques inequalities, which critiques the violences of colonialism and neo-colonialism. And decolonial scholarship is saying that that critique of those power asymmetries and that complex and violent history is important. But what about um, the kind of creative epistemologies and ontologies which have persisted um, in the shadows of what decolonial scholars call global coloniality, which are the, the relations, the ways of being which have been fostered by um, the colonial um, domination in the last 470 years or so. So it's about moving beyond critique, if that's helpful. It's about really um, uh, recovering, I suppose, but not merely recovering, kind of attending to voices which have always been present, but which have not frequently been um, celebrated or attended to sufficiently. Thank you, Amber. Um, the yellow geography, Steve, would that be one for you? I'm quite keen for um, Hyung Wa. Could you um, come on and say a little bit more about what you mean by that? Um, we got the person who asked the question. Yes. Yes, yes this is my wife's name. She's Chinese. I don't, oh, okay. I don't know quite why my wife's name came up. I only got I only got on a few minutes ago, like someone else. Wow. But uh, I don't quite understand how geography can be either black or brown or white. Uh, naturally, my wife uh, from Hong Kong and I uh, wonder why yellow isn't included in your uh, listing of the types of geography that's important to, to, uh, to learn, so as to have a full rounded understanding of the world. Incidentally, I mean, through our, I know you're not a history department, whenever we talk about Developments in Europe, the, you know, the greatest person in the world, the biggest journey, the great, it, it, it never includes Chinese. Um, that's a history problem. But how do you, how, why do you only mention black and brown and not yellow job? Is there something you're not understanding in my family? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. So it's uh, interesting because um, I was speaking with some teachers at the Geographical Association's um, annual conference um, over the weekend and one question that um, Simon Catling, who is Professor of um, Education at Oxford Brooks um, until recently asked what about um, Chinese colonialism and saying look kind of there's this critique that we're um, making of um, essentially kind of British Empire colonialism and the way in which that's represented in textbooks what about um, Chinese colonialism and uh, in that case we didn't actually get on the kind of any time to answer the questions to, to engage with it um, but my kind of initial reaction to that is to say that the tools with which we might talk about any kinds of colonialism just haven't been explored and haven't been developed and students haven't been given those kind of intellectual tools to be able to grapple and to be able to understand the kind of colonial logics that we're talking about 
And if you had those kinds of tools, then understanding the ways in which other colonial projects might or might continue um, to happen would also be a far more straightforward discussion than the current position where we ask question like to what extent has race or colonialism featured in your school geography and it's and it's nothing and so that's one part of it but I think the equipping students with greater understanding um, is an important aspect of it um, in terms of the role that um, the black geographers that we've been speaking about and um, that Amber kind of finished with um, a list of some of the people that we've been engaging with then the ways in which they're both speaking to particular aspects of that Black British experience and also responding to really the kinds of questions that we've got about the English, because um, it's not even kind of a British, but the English geography curriculum um, mean that those questions um, are the ones that are foregrounded. And absolutely, there are kind of many more other questions um, that we might ask. And the kind of whole nature of the South American experience and the ways in which that's represented is another completely kind of um, quite different question. Um, but because of the ways in which um, the British Empire's experience has been then transmitted through this silence and this representation in particular ways in curriculum then that's kind of um kind of led us to then respond in these kinds of ways and to engage um, with those kinds of people right. Amber, i don't know if there's anything else thank you yeah i mean pitch. just to say i think um that black and brown geographies is not a term that we have invented but is actually a subdisciplinary um, area within human geography and there's not a subdisciplinary area called yellow geographies um, but there you know there are subaltern geographies and there are asian geographies and there are indian geographies and post-colonial geographies which absolutely deal with asian experiences um, um, but that our focus, as Steve has rightly said, on Black um, geographies in particular deals with the acute forms of anti-Black racism in British society. Okay, thank you. Could I make Thanks, a comment? Sorry. Sorry. You, you go for it. Hey. I... Um... I came to this late, so you may have covered a lot of territory that I may be irrelevant to, but, but I'd like to interject this just for uh, uh, the record that when you, when you look at what Paul, the Apostle Paul said to the Athenians, uh, the, the text of that is, 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 is very precise when he says, of one, the Lord has made the race. In other words, race was a species of humanity. And so we got a linguistic problem there, but it also, if you re if you read that particular verse, to dwell of, of one, the Lord hath made the race ex hinos pan ethnos anthropon, uh, to dwell upon uh, the earth. But he goes on to say, sort of each in their own habitations, which is geographical. And uh, if you have a chance to to look at that and extrapolate that, that principle, I think is a Christian principle, whether or not it's been applied over time or not, obviously, uh, would fit very well within this. And that's my comment. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I was just gonna say as well, just kind of following on um, Andrew Lee's comment that he's put in the chat about um, particularly um, kind of anti-Asian sentiment um, as well. And just to kind of acknowledge that and the ways in which that kind of uh, completely agree with the historical peripheralization of non-hegemonic groups and um, particularly um, in the context of COVID. Um, kind of as mentioned the introductions and work that I've been doing in um, Kolkata recently and kind of colleagues there, the second that um, COVID-19 really kicked off, then the Chinese communities um, in areas of Kolkata and um, people who haven't been kind of back to China for, um, in some cases, generations, um, but then receiving um, really quite kind of extreme kind of marginalization and abuse and so on, and um, in the particular context of COVID. And for me, the, the further kind of support for the case that we're trying to make to say, look, we don't even have the language to talk about these issues. We don't even have, we're not equipping students, young people with the language to talk about race, to understand the ways in which 
it's been constructed and produced and so on. And so it means that the kind of ability for really populist and racist narratives to quickly get hold and to actually gain traction in media, um, it just isn't combated by the kinds of education that um, is kind of being offered. And so that's, again, I think a, a good example of why I think this case is so urgent and so important for um, school geography to engage with. So our time is unfortunately nearly up, but um, there's one more question in the chat, which I thought we could maybe finish with um, from Ronald asking how receptive are formal institutional or traditional geographers to this new disciplinary focus in your experience, what would you say? Um, yeah, thanks very much, Ronald, for that question. I would say, um, well, first to respond um, that I think um, you know, especially kind of some of my preliminary comments, um, we're trying to emphasize that that has been a mythology within the media that these movements are new within education to the anti-racist movements or movements to, you know, uh, critically push back against um, the ways in which our education perpetuates uh, power hierarchies, but that these are traditions, you know, that have, you know, 50, 60, 70 year roots. Um, and so they're really not new um, within the social sciences. Um, we just are hearing more about them. Um, but it, I suppose it really depends on which institution, right? So the Royal Geographical Society's annual conference, um, if, you know, three years ago, the theme was decolonizing geographies, opening geography up to the world. Um, there's an excellent commentary that was published by, um, you know, a, a handful of Black uh, British geographers calling out that um, you know, kind of what they call a move to innocence that the RGS, um, you know, claimed to be decolonizing geography and yet all of the keynotes looked at Spanish and Portuguese colonization rather than focusing on British, um, the histories of British colonialism. So there, you know, there certainly have been institutional moves to um, take racism seriously within the School of Geography and the Environment. We have an anti-racism task force. Um, we have released statements on, um, you know, saying that we're committed to anti-racist um, praxis and practice. Um, and so these conversations are, are ongoing and students in particular have been active in pushing um, for, you know, thinking about other ways of educating and um, not just, you know, for inclusion, but for different epistemologies and different ways of being in the world to be represented in their course content. Um, so I would say that this is not a trend and that this is going to be a persistent, you know, kind of conversation that will continue um, as we think about how geographers would like to contribute actively and meaningfully to, you know, a world in which we're facing forms of climate injustice and where, you know, racial inequalities are intimately entwined with the fallout from um, natural resource extraction and, and climate injustice. So I'm optimistic, um, uh, but that's not to say that there hasn't been a lot of hostility and um, uh, you know resentment as well so it's um, we're, we're continuing um, uh, but that's kind of the situation right now lovely and thank you for some more really interesting comments in the chat um, I think the um, the issue of actually having the the right language to start this conversation seems to be something that really emerges from this talk. Um, and this is something that not only the teachers need and the school students, but I think it's something that we all need um, really to overcome these issues that are uh, seeming to trouble us uh, more and more and still, which is actually absolutely shocking. Um, so thank you so much for alerting us um, to, uh, to you, these issues you found in the school curricula. Um, and thank you so much for uh, giving us your time and your expertise this afternoon. Um, I want to apologize to everybody who had uh, trouble logging into this session. I 
really can't work out right now what went wrong. I can only reassure you that we have a recording of this. Um, if you send um, me a quick email, I will let you have this or a, probably a YouTube link at some stage. Um, so you can watch it in your own time. Um, and I'm sure that Amber and Steve um, are still happy to, uh, to answer questions via email if I pass them on, if there's anything you would like to, um, to discuss or have answered 